How's it going, everyone? Welcome to the third and final interview preview leading up to my new course, Discover Game Design, available on April 11th, 2017. Today, we hear from Benjamin Anderson, also known as Heartbeast. He is a game maker developer who is responsible for many awesome tutorials and courses. He is currently working on his Kickstarter-backed game and lecture series. You can check that out in the description below, and I hope you enjoy the interview. So thanks for joining me, really. Um, I do appreciate that. And I have uh, a bunch of questions here, not only like six or so questions uh, related okay. to um, game development and game design, but um, really all about finishing your game or finishing your prototype or your engine. Um, that's really the focus of my uh, ebook here. And that's really what I wanted to talk about the most. Um, you know, there's only so many things you could say about finishing your game um, and, you know, without it being repetitive. Um, but I'm excited to hear your thoughts on it. But let's start with um, how did you get started with Game Maker or game development in general? Uh, in high school, I was in my computer-aided drafting class and I was bored. And <laughs> I, I was looking up, I wanted to try and make games. I don't know why. I was maybe playing like Lero or Pocket Tanks or something, you know, one of those old little games and I was like oh it'd be fun to make a game so I looked it up online and I found I think Game Maker 5 was out at the time right so I downloaded that and started messing around with that and uh, got addicted and then I just kind of never stopped <laughs> I mean there was a there was a small point in my life where I wasn't really doing a lot with Game Maker but definitely right about that time it was the next three or four years where I just all my free time I was messing around in Game Maker because I really had a lot of fun with it. Is it uh, all self-taught or did you do any like uh, school for it or anything like that? So I'm uh, in Game Maker mostly self-taught, but I did I did uh, take quite a few classes uh, for programming uh, at a college. And so, you know, I picked up some stuff from there and then I also got a few jobs programming. They're mostly web development jobs using JavaScript, but you know, you learn things and they carry over into other areas as well. And so I think that, you know, those really totally. helped me to improve as well. Totally agree. I just, um, I just built a custom uh, Rails blog for myself uh, to kind of push my web development skills to take that to the next level as well. It's, it's different but it's still all kind of related, um, especially when you get into the JavaScript thing, then it's just like a walk in the park from you know any other language for the most part once you uh, get rid of all the web stuff. Yeah. Uh, but that's, that's awesome. I was actually talking to um, Sandy Gordon the other day about um, you know, school and how um, I went to school for game design. I went for it for animation and game design. And mm -hmm. I quickly realized that I couldn't draw. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to stop doing animation. Uh, I still want to do it, but um, I like making it move. I don't like drawing the actual things. Um, so then I focused on the game design stuff. And the, um, the game development classes there were behind. They, they, and I was kind of upset about it because um, we were talking about this where the benefit of it was the networking. Like I got to meet all these people. Um, but I've learned so much more on my own. I mean, 10 years ago when I started doing this, uh, it was, you know, Googling on everything possible and then playing Newgrounds games and, and things like that just to kind of figure it all out and using Flash and stuff like that. Um, but I've just always learned so much more um, from tutorials and YouTube stuff like that. Um, so it's a very interesting uh, topic as to how people get started uh, with game development. Yeah, I think there I think there are different methods of learning and that some work better for other people. So for some people, a more structured system like college uh, works really well for them. And, you know, that's great. For me, it wasn't really my thing. I I learned like I remember when I was taking my physics class in college and I was learning about vectors and I was like, man, this is super boring. I hate vectors. <laughs> and then and then I started picking up Godot, the game engine, and and they had their little article on vectors, and I was like hooked. I was like, man, <laughs> vectors are so interesting. Look and what I, I can do. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> these are so cool. 
but I think it's context. And so I really need that context in order to be interested in something. And at school, I don't get the context. It's just, here's some information that is going to be useful. And it is useful. Right. You know, a lot of the time what they're teaching is useful, but I don't have the context for it. And so then I'm like, ah, this is boring. Right. That makes sense. I was thinking about um, the other day how it's like, world, you know, world history, for example, you learn about world history and you're like, well, uh, that didn't really, you know, have much meaning towards it. So it's no wonder why kids would start to to doodle, you know, and I mean that in, in like the best way possible, because obviously history is still interesting. But when it comes to the context of the class and like what you're focusing on, um, like every single day for me during school, this is why I actually took off of college. It was just getting so distracting to do those those courses. I'm like, I just want to do this. I just want to, you know, do exactly yeah. what I'm interested in doing. And um, that that to me is like the the whole issue at the moment. But I'm very thankful that um, there are people like you out there who are doing these tutorials that are so beneficial. And uh, I hope my tutorials, you know, get to the point where they're equally as beneficial. Um, and that actually kind of leads me into the next question that I had here, which was, um, you know, when you're making the game and you were saying um, Game Maker 5 and Godot, it's it's the uh, classic question, does software really matter? Or is it just learning the, the, the principles of the game? Well, I think, I think software does matter to an extent, obviously, because it depends on what you're trying to make. If you're trying to make uh, the next, if you're trying to make the next Skyrim clone or whatever, you're you're probably not going to use Game Maker, you know. Right, right. But, but uh, for the most part, you know, once you get past those big, huge, obvious limitations of certain softwares, then I I think you should use what you're comfortable with. So I know some people who are really comfortable in Unreal Engine. And I don't really like Unreal Engine's 2D, but you know what? They're already comfortable in Unreal Engine. And so building a game in 2D in Unreal works for them because they're already familiar with it. But for most people, especially starting off, I would recommend something that's not quite, you know, something more designed for 2D, like Construct or Game Maker, or even Godot is pretty, pretty easy to do 2D in. And so I think it does matter a little bit, but if you're already comfortable in one and you want to make a game, I say stick with that one uh, because it's going to be, it's going to, it, finishing a game is already hard enough. Right. If that one can do what you want to do, then use that engine because, or that software because you're already familiar with it. Right. And that's, that's really the key. And I agree with you. And that's perfectly said. Um, so that actually leads into my next question, which is how do you approach finishing a project? And I guess this could be more about, um, you know, finishing a tutorial or finishing a large course or finishing anything like what, how do you schedule yourself and how do you manage the craziness that comes with, you know, other things that aren't just ga game development, uh, real life in general. Um, what is the trick for your scheduling, especially with, um, a lot of indie, um, you know, developers being, for the most part, the ones that I've talked to or audience members um, are all solo. You know, they, they may have some people who uh, they hire out to do artwork or sound or something like that, but for the most part, they all do it by themselves. So I'm always curious to figure out what is the, the um, schedule, how do you hold yourself accountable, and how do you quantify that? Yeah, so I'm obviously not perfect in this area either. I have unfinished projects along the way. Uh, <laughs> I think I think for it's a little different for games and for courses and YouTube videos for me. For courses and YouTube videos, I'm able to make the reference project first, which limits my scope because once I finish the le the reference project, then that's going to be the course. And so it, it forces me to limit the scope of the project and then it doesn't really grow from there because the reference project is done. And then I create the video, the videos from that reference project, which limits the scope of the course and allows me to just record and then edit and then upload. Right. It's still, it still takes a while. And with my, 
Westwick course, I definitely feel like I, I had some scope creep in the sort in the reference project because originally I only promised some basic things like turn based combat and cutscenes and uh, navigating the world and, you know, dialogue between characters and stuff like that. So I only promised some basic things, but then as I was working on the ref the reference project, I ended up adding stuff like items and uh, ac an action system for the for the turn-based battle, so you could choose different actions to use during battle. And so I had some scope creep there, and I think that's that that can happen. But once once it's locked down in the reference project, then it makes it easier to do the course for games. Uh, I've finished some games. <laughs> I ha I have one project which a lot of people have are constantly asking me about, which is Grain War, and that one's kind of on indefinite hold right now. But the game, most of the games that I finished have been smaller scoped games. Uh, I actually finished a few games right after I picked up Game Maker, and those are actually pretty. Some of those are okay sized little games. I think for games you just have to. First of all, pick something that is going to stretch you a little bit, but not too much. Because it's easy to pick something that's too difficult and then get discouraged and give up. So you want to pick something that's maybe, maybe it's like, <clears throat> sorry, maybe it's like you know 90% or 95% of how to make this game already. And then there's 5% where you're like, well, I'm not sure how to do that yet, so I'm going to have to learn. And, and each time you start a project, it should be like that. At first, even, you're like, okay, well, I want to make a square that moves around on the screen. Right, right. That's a that, really... Um... <laughs> oh, no, I'll go ahead. I was just going to say, that's a really good place to start, because then your next project, you already know how to make a square move around on the screen. So what can you add to that? Or, you know, it's like the little bit at a time, almost like you start with something and then you add to it a little bit at first. Mm -hmm. And then later on, you're like, well, I know how to do this and this and this and this, but I don't know how to do this. And I want to make a project that involves it. So I'll, I'll take that part that I don't know how to know and add it onto what I do know how to know and, or do know how to make and then do something from there. That makes sense. That makes sense. And that's, uh, it's funny that you mentioned that because the, the game that I always recommend people start with, um, well, just to, when they ask me, you know, how can I finish a game? That's like this, it is literally the second most asked question next to, can I make my game or can you tell me how to make my game multiplayer? <laughs> it's literally uh, what they always ask is how can I finish my game? And uh, have you played the world's hardest game, the old flash game? Do you remember that at all? I think I've seen it. I've actually never played it, but I've it's the perfect it. example of what you were just saying. Cause it's just a box, you know, that way uh, you don't have to do any artwork uh, and it's tough as nails and it's 30 levels of progression and it gets harder and harder and harder. And the whole point is to make it from one part of the level to the other part of the level and avoid um, spinning blue circles. And um, I, I had told the student about this recently and they immediately responded with, oh, this is great. I can do this because it's like manageable. It's that simple. It's that bite-sized little bit of a, a game engine. And as soon as they finished the first level, they, they built up the momentum and they felt so great that they were going to go on and make the next few levels. And I was like, awesome. That's exactly what uh, I was trying to achieve with that. Um, yeah, I think there's, I think there's, I've been kind of thinking about this term lately, which is just called the quick win. And psychologically it seems like a really good idea for game development and it seems part of why i think people like game makers so much it's like you get this you get you start working on this project and within like 10 or 15 minutes you can have a little character moving around on the screen you know right. and that quick win like the immediate feedback from what you've done is so important to get them excited about it and moving on because with some larger engines it can take a little bit longer sometimes to get something going like that and feel like you understand it and know where it's going. And so that that kind of quick win is really important. And so both in, I think, in tutorial videos and inside of games that you'd be making, giving 
uh, if the person making the game can see f see something that is actually a game really quickly, mm -hmm. then it gets them excited about it and motivates them to move on. Right, versus doing something that they start and then they can't figure out for like an hour and then you're sitting there like, why isn't this working? That's actually a great point because that goes to why I stopped doing, um, you know, and like, uh, you know, the bigger engines and I went to Construct um, was to get the quicker win. Um, not mm -hmm. necessarily because I couldn't handle the other engines, but um, because I found that since it's so, so designed to be all about that, it's literally meant to just, you know, drag and drop and add the behaviors um, that it, it kind of worked out perfectly that way. But at the same time, there's still, you know, some learning that uh, comes with that. Um, that you need to understand how this works, you know. So, for example, um, if you have a box in Construct and you just, you know, call it, that's your sprite object, uh, and then you put the platform behavior on, you're done. <laughs> you're like, okay, that was easy, and now the keyboard yeah. control works, and you're like, and for the most part, honestly, from my experience, it has. You have to tweak a few settings to make it feel correct, you know, to make it feel like it's it's a viable platformer. Um, but for the most part, it takes out the whole, you know, I guess. If you're really a true a true beginner, it takes out the the um, overwhelming bit of you know learning how to do collisions and <laughs> learning how to do uh, the input or input mapping or anything like that that you would normally have to do. I know that when I um, messed around with Game Maker, I always found it very easy to do it. But then when it came to collision, for some reason, it's like okay, so now I'm not using the standard gravity. I have to make my own gravity system I have to use. Um, you know, that for me never never clicked. Um, yeah, especially, especially, I feel like Game Maker, you can do platformers, but the actual system, you know, that, that's already in place for gravity and collisions and stuff doesn't really work well for platformers. You can, you can do it, but it feels like this weird hassle. And so... You know, I agree. That's one of the things that I think is a little bit odd about Game Maker is that it was designed to try and be really simple, but for a platform game, it's really, it's really not. <laughs> and it's really counter. It doesn't just handle it in a simple way, <laughs> right? And and that's at first, um, you know, when people first starting out. And I guess that's just the the initial hump, right? It's like when you're really beginner and. Um, it's kind of the best part about it because you can be 10 years old or you could be 60 years old. It really doesn't matter where you are. Um, you know, you just have to get through that hump that you were saying, the quick win. You know, you just have to get these quick wins, uh, start over, start again. But at, at the same time, you have to finish what you wanted to achieve uh, and move forward with that. And I think that's great. I think it's a great thing. Yeah. I think especially when you're very first starting, starting over a lot is a good thing uh, because you don't really know what you're doing. And so you can start down this project and realize, wait a minute, uh, there's no way I can do this right now. And starting over a lot is a good thing. And uh, But when you start over, scope down. Every time you start over, make something smaller because if you're starting over, then it should be because it was too too much of a project for you. It wasn't something that you could accomplish at that time. So always go smaller, never go bigger. Don't be like, oh, I was making an RPG and I couldn't do it. So now I'm making an MMO. <laughs> you know? like, yeah, exactly. Scale down every <laughs> single time and, and get to where you hit something that you actually can finish. Uh, the first game I finished was kind of like a space shooter game, you know? Uh, the, the It was a spaceship on the bottom of the screen that moved back and forth and shot lasers and hit these enemies and I had a lot of fun because once I had that base system in, I could start adding different weapons to it, like different upgrades and I added all these kind of creative weapons, like one where it was this bullet, whenever it hit an enemy, it created eight more bullets that came out from that enemy. So it was like this chain reaction on the screen that was kind of cool. And so I had a lot of fun with that, but it was a really simple game that I could make. and. And I think that's where people need to start is scale down if it's too big, but get to a size that you can actually finish something small, finish it, and then move on. And then move to the next one. Rinse, repeat. Um, it, is that your first game? Was that the actual first game that you really finished or for yourself that you considered, wow, I did that? Yeah, yeah, it was. I don't think it's online anymore, unfortunately. I don't think I have the source to it. The, the first, the one that I finished after that is still online. 
and uh, it's called Deep Magic, and it's this little wizard guy, little platformer. And that one, that one was, I mean, it was a pretty, I, <laughs> I was pretty happy with it. I think I was maybe 16 when I finished it, 15 or 16. Yeah. So it's a pretty good little game for 15 or 16. I'm still proud of it as far as, as, far as that goes, That's great. especially considering how old I was. <laughs> That's great. I think I finished my first game around 15. And I, I, I'm not sure if it's still up, but it was uh, a Flash game. It was uh, made in Action Script 2, <laughs> and it was awful. It was about um, Santa shooting candy canes at other Santas. <laughs> I don't know why I made that, but uh, that was the whole game. And I put in this upgrade system where you could upgrade your candy cane, and I don't know what I was thinking. But uh, I'm still proud of that too, honestly. I was proud I figured some of that stuff out, especially with Flash, and that was right before Flash. No, I guess it was a few years before Flash died, but it was like still um, an acceptable medium. <laughs> and, and, then, uh, and then Game Maker really took over for a while. And then it kind of lulled out. But then it came back, and now it's just whew, all the rage. And I guess that's kind of where those questions come from. Like, does the software matter or anything like that? Because they see so many successful games being made with the software, and that's totally great for the software. You know, it's like huge. Uh, that's like marketing on its own, right? It's just selling the product uh, yeah. just by showing what you can make with it. And I think that that's great for what it is, but there are other options out there if it's not the best option for you. and um, like using Godot is a completely different experience and it's actually a ridiculously fun experience. Uh, yeah. when you were showing that to me the first time I was like, my mind was blown. I was like, Whoa, this is really cool. Cause I've, I've used, I went from flash and then to Java, which I don't recommend. Uh, and, or no, sorry, flash basic. I made a game in basic that was awful. <laughs> and then Java, uh, then I did C sharp for a while. Um, and I got into doing some 3D development. And then the first 3D thing I made was this big Slenderman clone. And that was totally fun. Um, but then I was like, you know what? I really like 2D. So then I went back to Game Maker. And then I stuck with Construct just because it was faster to prototype the ideas. So I, I, when people ask me, you know, software, and I say, you know, I've used every single software for the most part. Um, just mess around with the one that is right for you. Because so many software is changing. Godot 3 is coming out soon. Yeah, and, um, I'm excited for that. That's going to be really cool. Um, I'm kind of crossing my fingers they do something visual. I know that there was a talk of it. Um, I think there's huge potential for a good visual scripter. And that's not to say that Construct isn't a good visual scripter. I just think it could be so much better. And Construct 3 is coming out soon, too, so we'll see. <laughs> um, yeah, what I've seen, I've actually seen some of the visual scripting in Godot. Oh, and... really? Yeah, because they've started some of it, and it seems, you know, I guess it's I guess it's a visual scripting, and there's some powerful aspects to it, but it seems like a maybe not quite good, as good version of blueprints so oh. far. So we'll see where they take it and kind of what happens with it. But you know, it's it's almost underrated, and I understand that people who who can really you know program, they want to have the control of programming and I get that and I've missed the feel of typing sometimes <laughs> it's very enjoyable to, to manually write out the code um, but there's definitely something to be said for the speed of delivery so just just for the quick win when you're starting out um, and especially if you don't understand logic as well um, I know a lot of the artists that I talk to who want to make their own games they have um, you know they want to prototype their ideas quickly uh, so something like that would be handy um, and then I guess for construct purposes, they kind of get let down a little bit when it comes to seeing, you know, all the game maker shaders that that game maker can do. And you see all these like fancy like flares and effects. I'm like, well, yeah, you that takes more work, but you can make this move. <laughs> you can make this shoot with very minimal stuff, and you have great art. So, you know, yeah. So that's where uh, I guess they're coming from, but. Um, let me see here what else I had written down. So, okay, perfect. That leads into the next question, which is what's something you know now that you wish you had known? Because we definitely have a lot more resources available to us than when we started out. Um, I started out really young, which is why I think I feel comfortable saying when we started out. I started out when I was like nine <laughs> and I'm, uh, I'm 23 soon. I'm 23 in like a week. So I've been doing this for a while and I remember the resources being 
very small. <laughs> and I remember Game Maker 5. Uh, and then, you know, remember when you had to go into Game Maker 5 and do the cherry tutorial? Remember that one? Like, the, was that Game Maker 5 or Game Maker 8? I don't remember. I don't remember, I don't remember which one it was. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I just remembered like those were those were the resources that you had available to you. Um, oh, but back to my question, which was what was hard for you then and what do you feel is hard now? So let's see. The first question you asked me was what do I wish I had known back then that I know now, right? Right, right. Yeah, that one is, uh, I would say, state machines. <laughs> and I, state machines the first two games i made didn't have them and let me tell you all those if conditions you know if walking if attacking if doing this it's state machines definitely make that a lot easier oh, yeah. and easier to debug and work with uh as far as uh the second question which was what was hard for me back then versus hard for me now I think definitely finding resources back then was a lot harder. I when I I would there were some people who would put their source code online and and I would download their source code and just plow through it. I would yeah, <laughs> I would look through it. Looks I read the help I read the documentation when I was like 15, the game maker documentation from start to finish. <laughs> the whole uh, that's that's how addicted I was. Uh. And and at the time, it, a lot of it didn't stick, you know, because like I said, context, it's really important. And, and I read through it and I forced myself through it, but there was a lot of stuff in there that didn't make sense to me at all. And because I was brand new to it. And so, you know, but looking through people's code and trying to figure out how stuff worked and trying to use a documentation, it was a, it was a slow process, but little by little, I was able to figure stuff out. And I think, I think, tutorial videos and uh, any sort of any sort of tutorial content out there whether it's videos or written I think that helps give you the context and I was actually talking with uh, someone about this the other day I think learning to I think learning a language is like learning to speak and and you can and tutorial videos they kind of they kind of give you the words you like see all these words and you see it's like listening to someone else speak you can see them forming the sentences you can see the words and little by little you start to understand them while they're speaking that language now it doesn't mean you can speak the language yet uh because i actually learned portuguese and and there were times when i was learning it where it was really a lot easier to understand them than it was for me to articulate what I wanted to say. I couldn't form the sentences. I knew a lot of the words. I knew a lot of how the grammar worked, but it just takes practice to form the sentences. And I think that's how programming is. And so all the resources out there, they kind of make that first part of getting the context, hearing the words, watching other people form the sentences. That part's easier. The part that you have to do still is the hard part, which is you still have to sit down and try it on your own. Right. And you have to you have to step away from the tutorial videos. You have to try and do stuff on your own. You have to try and form those sentences, you know, and write some code without anybody's without following a tutorial. And you're going to do it wrong when you're learning to speak a new language. You do it. You you make so many mistakes, and that's okay because making the mistakes is part of how you learn. And so that's what it's like. You're gonna you're gonna make those mistakes. So I think that's a lot easier now than it was before. What's harder now that I still think is that, at least in Game Maker, uh, there's not really best practices for doing stuff in Game Maker. There, the documentation only gives like small context, like this is how you use this function, but there's not like nice documentation or not. I guess that's not what I'm trying to say. There, there are certain ways to do things in Game Maker that are better than others. Right. And and there's not a community for sharing that kind of thing right now. And a lot of the developers out there just kind of wing it. You know, they're just like, oh, well, this works. Just throw something together and it works. But, you know, there are other developers who have found better ways to do stuff. And I wish more people would share that information, like make tutorial videos on it or whatever. I've been trying to share the things that I've been learning along the way. And I've been actually got onto this project called the Game Maker Community Manual. 
which uh, is still kind of in the works. We don't know exactly which direction it's going to go, but I think that's going to be the solution to that problem is that uh, the, the kind of more knowledgeable developers out there like Julian Adams and, uh, you know, there are a lot of them. He's just one of the first ones that I think of because he's worked on stuff like Hyperlight Drifter, you know, oh. big name out there as far as Game Maker goes. And I, I think... I think if those kind of people had a platform for sharing their knowledge and all the other developers out there that maybe we don't even know of who have come up with really unique ways of doing stuff that's a good way of doing it to share their knowledge, it's going to be a lot better for beginners and people just starting to be able to have a place that's like, okay, these are the best practices. This is If you want to do this thing, this is a really good way to structure it, so you should look at this. That's it for the interview preview. I hope you enjoyed listening. The full interview will be released alongside Discover Game Design. If you haven't already checked it out, go to discovergamedesign.com to read the free ebook and access the Game Loop formula. See you next time.